गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी टूडे इज द फर्स्ट डे ऑफ द प्रेजेंटेशन बाय सेमेस्टर वन स्टूडेंट्स एंड टुडे दे आर गोइंग टू मेक प्रेजेंटेशन ऑन द लिटरेचर रिटर्न ड्यूरिंग द टाइम ऑफ चौसर टू रेस्टोरेशन एज लेट एस हैव द लिस्ट ऑफ द प्रेजेंटर्स फॉर दिस मॉर्निंग सेशन आई एम शेयरिंग अ स्क्रीन टू सी द लिस्ट ऑफ द प्रेजेंटर्स okay so uh, in the first morning session today on the first day we will have first presentation by akshay nimbark and he will make it on the rover unleashed the uh, history of theatrical interpretations uh, it will be followed by chaya dihora's presentation on portrayal of women in afra bens the rover uh, a slight correction in the title when you put the title the rover or any title of the text put it in single inverted comma as we are seeing that in rahul's a presentation a topic the rover so that you have to put it in single inverted comma whether you write it uh, uh, in exams handwritten uh, exam paper or whenever you are typing make this a habit of putting the title of the text in single inverted comma a uh, third one will be by darshan wag on heather a cinematic uh, reimagining of uh, hamlet in title all the key words should be capitalized so the word reimagining also is the key word so that also should have capital r all key words like of can be small o in can be small i but a and can be small a but if it is a key word not this connectors then it should be capitalized in the title uh, jagruti will make it on metaphysical poetry p should be capital in poetry kavita uh, will read on red color and indication of red and blood in macbeth macbeth in single inverted comma uh, here there will be a problem because macbeth is a name of a character also so when you write without single inverted comma you are talking about the character so if your presentation is on the character of macbeth then it is okay but if it is about the play that is macbeth uh, blood in the play then you have to put it in single inverted comma rahul will uh, read on adaptation of the rover from stage to a screen this last words also you can capitalize capital f capital s for stage and screen also uh colon also you have to be colon is very near to the word previous word there is no space between previous word and colon there is no space so that you can remove uh akash chauda will read on lady macbeth the enigmatic fourth witch of shakespeare's uh, macbeth uh which w uh, needs to be capital fourth f should be capital macbeth you have used in double inverted comma in title it can be allowed if you use it the only confusion is that when uh, people write quotes somebody said something quote then quote is written in double inverted comma so if you want to differentiate between quote and the text then single and double inverted commas are used otherwise in title where there are no quotes double inverted comma also is acceptable uh, bhumiba will read on the art of satire uh, dryden versus uh, swift Uh, there is no need to have a dot after v s a dhatri will read on metaphysical myths machine a comparative exploration of poetry in all this last words all capital words all uh, words should be capitalized with c e and p uh, hardi will make a presentation on afra bens the rover a subversive challenge to social norms again the same thing the rover should be in single inverted comma uh finally in the morning session we will have by uh, hiral and that will be on forced marriage in the rover analyzing arguments and uh, defenses okay. uh there is no need to keep entire title in double inverted comma here eh, because this is only for the title so that double inverted comma you can remove for the rover you have to keep the inverted commas okay so let us start with the first one uh, akshay you can uh, uh, start with your presentation i 
I think that one is disconnected. Ah, it's there. Okay. Ah, yes. Ha. Ah, once they start, then you start the time. Yeah. Ha. Ah, from introduction. Okay. Open. You are in a different classroom. Open the classroom. Uh, now click on. Corner we have to change. There is a logo there. No. Open your class and then you change. Open your assignment. Hello everyone, very good, good morning to all of you. 
today i am dealing with the presentation about afra ben's famous the rover the rover unleashed a history of theoretical interpretation i am dealing with this topic history of theoretical interpretation of the rover so the theoretical interpretations means uh, uh, a director and the actors they how to they perform on the stage on screen like and how they wear their costumes and all the things i have to describe this is my personal introduction this is my content points ben throws a brief background so afra ben afra ben was a writer english play writer he, she was born in 1614 and died in 1689 so afra ben write many play right and the rover is the one of the he, her famous work so the play rover was set was the setting of the rover was on uh, nepal during carnival season in in it written in 1677 and perform also in that year the rover was written and performed during the 17th century restoration period after english theater had been closed for nearly 20 years the play's reception the rover was immediately successful and loved by audience despite being a bold and controversial piece in the whole play like the rover concept context is the four englishmen in the angelica and elena they are all the characters in the play and the themes of the play was love and thunder like so early theatrical production the first productions of the rover on stage is uh, the rover premiere in 1677 and become an instant classical so first in a restoration period they are not uh, development of the uh stages in theaters so in the starting of this production there are silly things are right that they are not uh, um, well prepared or well costumed and then in 1819th and 20th century the adaptations and interpretation interpretations are going up throughout the years directors and play, playwright have found fresh way to approach the play's exploration of sexual politics the power of costume the costume was also very much important in the theater like costume designer have long found inspiration in vt and rebellious characters of the rover so notable revivals and adaptations during different centuries like 18th and 19th century when the restaurant theater were not developed at much so there are restaurant drama decline in popularity but the rover remained a favorite production became grander and more melodramic in 18th and 19th century was the starting of the restoration um, theater period of this rover in 20th century was Redis discover in 20th century with key production talking place in the US and UK by directors such as Oren Welles and Trevor Nunn in 20th century the all the directors and product productions are creating the different way of the rover in 20th century they def, define the moral of the store, uh, stage performance in 21st century contemporary adaptation have brought new life the play exploration of gender power and colonialism for playful remain in political statements these three are the uh, contemporary interpretations of the rover the rover is 2016 production play gender and sexual politics the rover caribbean dream was also a very famous adaptation of the rover the rover Hashtag Me Too edition was the uh, contemporary interpretation of the rover. This is the very much famous by the uh, 
रॉयल शेक्सपियर कंपनी क्रू द रोवर्स लेगेसी इन्फ्लुएंस द रोवर एंड फेमिनिज्म द प्लेस बोल्ड पोर्ट्रेल ऑफ जेंडर एंड सेक्सुअल पॉलिटिक्स प्लेड वे फॉर मॉडर्न फेमिनिस्ट मूवमेंट रिस्टोरेशन ड्रामा इन द रोवर द प्ले हेल्प एस्टैब्लिश एंड डिफाइन जॉनरा व्हिच रिमेंस पॉपुलर टू दिस डे द रोवर एंड मॉडर्न थिएटर the play continues to inspire director playwright and performers to push their boundaries in theater expressions the rover always the inspiring director and playwright and also actors the performers they are keeping moving ahead to this uh, rover in developing it conclusion the rover stand as remarkable adapt- adaptable and enduring work in theatrical interpretation its flexibility allows for a fresh look at themes like love desire and gender dynamics making it relevant for today's audience this play legacy lies in its ability to reflect and adapt to changing soci- societal values offering a unique perspective and inspiring artist artistic innovation the rover is not just a production of its time but a lens through which we can explore timeless themes and continues to cap- captivate both audience and creators making it value- valuable gems in the world of theater these are my references think if you have any questions then ask the power of con- costumes matter in the play like room costumes are so much important in the theater play like uh, wearing is the most important the costume also makes the character signification example like angelica short costume also makes the he makes her characters like prostitute theater are important for us or not theater are very important for us because theaters makes the whole play develop and also making uh, the plays uh, very important thank you everyone
Yes, sir. Actually, I'm on another tab. Good morning to all. Today I'm going to deal with the topic portrayal of woman in the in Afra Benz, the rover. Here my personal information. Here point to be discussed today. Afra Ben, Florinda, Helena, Angelica, and the portrayal of woman in 17th century. Afra Ben. Uh, she was born in uh, 16 or uh, 14. Contemporary United Kingdom and uh, date in uh, 16 April 1689, uh, London, United Kingdom. Uh, occupation playwright, poet, and uh, translator. Uh, she was uh, uh, first woman in uh, England to identify herself as a professional writer. Uh, uh, she wrote to the occasion and, uh, may, un and uh, earn money. And uh, she undertook a spying mission uh, for Charles II. Uh, here, first character, uh, Florinda. Uh, she is a young Spanish uh, noblewoman uh, who is a passionate, uh, intelligent, and a strong willed. Uh, she went to marry uh, uh, English Colonel Bill Weil, whom she loved. Uh, and went to marry, but uh, she must obey a uh, obey a uh, order of her father and uh, brother Don Pedro uh, to uh, marry who they see fit for her. She is a multifaceted character and uh, present the uh, big mixture of qualities uh, and uh, complica complexities of human role. Uh, her her character uh, encompasses. Uh, restorations woman struggle uh, in the marriage and uh, her character uh, rep her character represents the theme of love loyalty and uh, struggle for independence move ahead uh, helena she is uh, described as a, a young a gay young woman designed for a nun and she is a protagonist in the play and a female rover in the play she is the most independent and outspoken of all female characters. Uh, Helena, uh, Helena the, then exposed the struggle of uh, self-identification. Uh, her character reflects a sense of freedom and a willingness to challenge, challenge societal uh, constraints. Move ahead, another character, Angelica Bianca. Uh, known as a famous courtesan and prostitution. Uh, she is a complex character and uh, known for her intelligent and uh, charm. Uh, Angelica's role reflects a uh, need for representation and agency for women during the restoration. Uh, her uh, observation that uh, women need reliable male support, we can uh, uh, see through this character, Angelica, portrayal of women in the 17th century. Uh, women were always suppressed in the society due to the uh, patriarchal or ideologies. Uh, when uh, uh, female characters strive for independence and the limitations of uh, marriage, uh, each woman begin the play bound one of the three fates. Florinda to marriage, Helena to be nunnery, and Angelica to well-paid prostitute. Uh, female, the female character in the play challenge uh, traditional gender roles and uh, society societal uh, norms of the time. 
the actions and treatment of uh, women in uh, afra beings play exposed the narrow soci social uh, limitations within which early modern british women found themselves and uh, the main uh, marriage uh, self identification and uh, uh, re social representations are all topic that describe uh, by uh, behin uh, celebration of independence and freedom of carnival for women are not allowed but uh, behin shows women are not powerless than men uh, this is the reality of victorian society uh, in the play rover here my reference thank you if you have any question then ask me Sir, what does Florida's characters reveals about women agency in the 17th century? Um, Florida's character in the rover shows that uh, women had a limited control over their lives and uh, choices due to societal rules. According to you, nullary is good or not? Mm. According to me, nullary is, uh, is not good. Because uh, we have we have uh, we have life uh, to enjoy and uh, make uh, our decision and uh, so laundry is not good as much. Okay, thank you. First, we have to say the screen from here, from here. Present, share screen. Go for counting. Then this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Mm. Share. share.
very good morning everyone darshan this side and i am here with the presentation on heather a cinematic reimagining of hamlet uh, this is my personal information uh, this is points to ponder and now over you uh, heather is a, a bollywood movie based on a shakespearean play hamlet it was uh, released in 2014 its genre is action crime drama thriller and romance and it was directed by vishal bharadwaj uh, it has uh, won many awards and above all heather is the fifth highest rated crime drama of all time according to imdb it was rated 8 out of 10 and now about the director so vishal bharadwaj is a versatile entity in our india and he is a director screenwriter producer music composer and a playback singer other than uh, uh, hamlet uh, other than heather he has uh, uh, adapted many other uh, shakespearean uh, play like makbul based on macbeth omkara based on othello and now we are seeing heather uh, uh, vishal bharadwaj desi adaptation is still unmatched in the arena of bollywood now uh, the major cast of movie is uh, which we see shahid kapoor tabu k k menon shraddha kapoor uh, late ek, uh, actor irfan khan and narendra jha these are the roles and these are the base role on the play uh, now we see the contrast in setting uh, we see that hamlet uh, setting is danish court uh, in the castle of elsinore and heather we see uh, the Uh, setting is uh, kashmir in the middle of insurgency now the ghost representation in heather we are aware about the uh, ghost uh, scene uh, by uh, uh, king hamlet but in the heather we see it was personified uh, ghost and name ruhdar and it was played by the irfan khan adding a realistic touch to the super uh, supernatural element now cultural context we see that uh, in hamlet is uh, Uh, follows the traditional elizabeth uh, culture and politics in which uh, heather we see it incorporates the modern social political context of kashmir and the impact of insurgency now the theme uh, so th uh, theme is pretty much same but there is a bit contrast here too hamlet uh, see the uh, hamlet uh, in hamlet we universal theme uh, revenge madness and morality but in heather we see insurgency militarization political conflict adding a layer of social political relevance uh, it is typical movie so there uh, there will be music and all in heather but in hamlet we don't find any now distinctive beginning uh, hamlet beginning we starts that uh, it uh, starts with the ghost appearing and heather we see it was a scene of kashmir and the father of hamlet was uh, helping a militant and because of due to that act he was first captured and then uh, assassinated by the indian army now distinctive climax uh, so we see that a uh, typical uh, shakespearean play all the characters are uh, dead at the end uh, same goes to hamlet but in the movie we see that uh, uh, not all the characters are dead uh, protagonists and antagonists of the uh, uh, story are still alive in the hamlet we see hamlet and his uh, uncle uh, claudius both are dead at the end but in the movie heather and the uh, khurram both are alive so it gives an optimistic ending uh, due to his high body count and uh, it is uh, totally fine because it was a creative liber uh, liberty uh, by vishal bharadwaj so in conclusion heather is a worth watching movie uh, and it uh, has the soul of a hamlet uh, play and above all it uh, uh, shows the heat we can feel the heat of kashmir and how uh, their people their awam is uh, suffering from uh, this problem this is my citation now you can ask me if you have query Darshan, according to you, why did the director change the ghost context in the in narration? I mean, if he want, he could portray a ghost like other movies. Yes, he can. But uh, you know, many Bollywood movie have shown the uh, ghost representation. But I guess uh, by doing that, I think 
movie like Heather would uh, lost the touch of realistic elements. That's why maybe Vishal Bharadwaj has done it. Any other? So, Vishal Bharadwaj has yes, uh, changed the climax very uh, pretty huge way, but uh, I guess uh, it gives a good uh, or it conveys a good message to society that uh, if uh, in the Heather it sees that uh, revenge only creates the revenge, but uh, in the Hamlet we see that revenge by doing revenge and violence, there is nothing uh, to get, and Heather conveys a good message that revenge only creates revenge. Thank you very much. See you at the next presentation. You can borrow this hotspot from somebody. Namo Wi-Fi. Network issue is there in the moment. So if somebody else's mobile, you can ask for a hotspot and get. So, but you have to ask from your ID. Yes, next one. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Shagruti Wada and today I'm presenting the metaphysical poetry paper number one literature of Elizabethan and restoration periods. This is the content that uh, I will discuss. Uh, what is the metaphysical poetry definition questions 
and the first concept of metaphysical poetry and the uh, difference between metaphysical poets and the other poets and uh, general characteristics. So first of all, uh, everyone's minds has a question that what is metaphysical poetry? So metaphysical poetry is the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principle of things, uh, including uh, abstract concepts like knowing, identity, uh, time and space also. The term metaphysical or metaphysics in poetry is the fruit of Renaissance tree becoming approaching pure science. Metaphysical is the Latin word and it is a combination of two words like meta and physics. Meta means beyond and physics means the physical nature or world. So this is the definition of metaphysical poetry. Uh, metaphysical poetry is a highly intellectualized poetry and uh, in generous con concepts. And metaphysical poetry means it is a uh, poetry that goes beyond the world physical of the senses and also explore the spiritual world. Generally, metaphysical deals with the questions that cannot be answered by the science and is uh, questions about natural world in the philosophical way. Uh, here is a few metaphysical questions like, uh, uh, does God exist? Is that everything happens is uh, predetermined? Uh, is consciousness limited to brain? And consequently, what is the difference between uh, perceptions? So this is the questions about the metaphysical poets that cannot be answered by the science. Science and uh, 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 questions is about the natural world in a philosophical way. So here is a where is the concept about the metaphysical poetry? The first, the metaphysical poetry is a uh, first coined by the Samuel Johnson, the literary critic and poet, in his uh, famous book uh, *Lives of the Most Eminent English Poet*. Uh, written around uh, 1879 and 1781. In this book, Johnson wrote about the group of 17th century British poets that include John Duns, uh, George Herbert, Richard Cresciu, Andrew Marvel, and Henry Wogan also. He was also not that, uh, he was also not that, uh, not that the 17th century British uh, poets that uh, John Dunn, George Herbert, and uh, Andrew Marvel also. How the metaphysical poets are different than the other poets? The metaphysical poets are different than the other poets uh, because early poets uh, take an example regarding the related fields when metaphysical poets uh, bring the image which are not usually connected. Uh, for example, in John Dunn's poem, The Flea, The Flea is uh, compared with the love. And the fleas bite become metaphor for their uh, emotional and uh, and physical connection. So we can say the imagination and uh, imagination and unusual uh, uh, metaphor is a hallmark of metaphysical poetry. They try to intellectual than the other poets, and religion is not only theme of metaphysical poets. So the general characteristics of metaphysical poetry first is a use of far-fetched image. So far-fetched or uh, unconventional image is a typical feature of metaphysical poetry, where a poet uses uh, uses to elaborate metaphors to uh, explore complex uh, themes and uh, ideas and emotions. And these images are also referred to the concepts. Uh, uh, the most of the famous example of uh, this characteristics is a uh, is a John Dunn's poem uh, "The Flea" that I have mentioned earlier. And uh, another example of uh, this characteristics is a uh, George Herbert's "The Collar." In this poem, uh, the poet used the image of uh, collar symbolize that the obligation of life and uh, and contrasting with the freedom of God surviving. The second uh, characteristics is the uh, uses of wit. This is the center uh, characteristics of the metaphysical poetry. Even metaphysical uh, poets uh, are known for their clever and intellectual wordplay. Uh, wit, uh, wit is a uh, uses uh, elaborate, uh, elaborate, uh, explore uh, complex themes and ideas and emotions also. Third one is a dramatic manner and direct tone of speech. Uh, this is the main characteristics of a metaphysical poetry, the dramatic manner in a starting poem line starting poem in the line uh, for example uh, john dunn's poem the canonization in this poem a uh, poet uh, gives the starting line uh, in dramatic manner for example for god's sake uh, hold your tongue and let me love for god's sake hold your tongue and let me love the uh, last one and the uh, fourth the mixture of sensual and spiritual experience 
uh, this characteristic is especially appears in uh, John Donne's uh, uh, poetry. For example, uh, his uh, famous poem, the Iktesi. In this poem, a poet uh, speaks about the soul and spiritual love, which they come out their bodies and uh, conversation uh, with one another. So this is the general characteristics of metaphysical poetry. This is my reference. If there are any questions, you can ask me. So my question is, what is the metaphysical concept? Uh, metaphysical concepts is a is a complex themes uh, that make a comparison between uh, spiritual aspects of person and physical things of the world. Concise is a comparison between uh, uh, spiritual aspects and physical uh, things in the world. Is there any? My question is, what, is, what are the main features of metaphysical poetry? The main feature of metaphysical poetry is the far-fetched image that I have mentioned earlier that uh, uh, far-fetched image or unconventional uh, uh, imagery is the main feature of metaphysical poetry because uh, because poet uh, uses uh, used to elaborate metaphors to uh, uh, explore their uh, explore their complex themes, ideas and emotions also. Thank you. But still, the logo is coming on. Slide show. Okay, you push this button. Hello, everyone. Good morning to all of you. Today, the first day of my present presentation and my presentation topic are red color and indication of red and uh, blood in Macbeth. My personal information, point to ponders, 
introduction about the author. William Shakespeare by name, by name, by name, Bard of Avon or Swan of Avon, born in uh, April 26, uh, 1564, Stratford upon Avon, England, and died uh, April 23, 1660, Stratford upon Avon. He was an English poet, dramatist, and actor, often called the English national poet and considered by name the greatest dramatist of the all time. Shakespeare occupied a position unique in the world literature. About the play Macbeth, the play was first published in under the title The Tragedy of Macbeth in first folio of 1623. Three witches tell the Scottish general Macbeth that he will the king of Scotland and encouraged by his wife. Macbeth kill the king and become the new king and kill more people out of paranoia. Civil war erupt to overthrow Macbeth and uh, resulting in more death. Red color in literary review. Red is defined as uh, having characterized by the color which uh, appear at the lower or listed reacted and of uh, visible spectrum and uh, is uh, familiar in nature as that uh, of blood, fire, various flowers and grape fruits, whence the frequent similar red are blood and fire. Red is uh, used uh, different language to express feeling or the associate cultural meanings. Uh, therefore, red culture associate might be hard luck due to cultural gaps, which are the caused by the lack of inequalities between two cultures, Arabic and English cultures. Arabic and English culture exhibit some devices associated in the use of red indicate love, passion, danger, and so on. Their co collocation of red clarify under the category as follow. The red are red and part of the body, red and blood, red and emotion, moral attitudes, red and disease, red and other colors, red and nature. Red have a negative and positive association in the Arabic and English culture use. Red is the red is one of the color found in Shakespeare's work. For example, red in Macbeth related to her related to the face of servant. When he tells Macbeth that there are ten thousand men coming to kill him and he, the servant is so scared, he is ghostly white. Macbeth get mad at the servant for looking so scared and tell him go sprick thy face and over red thy fear. Indication of red and blood. A state that blood have various indication in the Macbeth. Consider there are two expression. It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. And uh, second, they found the uh, of your blood is stopped have uh, indication of revenge as being vengeful blood. Their study have founded uh, several red and blood meaning brave blood. Expression, brave blood indicate the over, uh, overuse of killing and unability to show him as a knight who can revenge and take an action. Second is uh, guilty blood. This expression means that, that how individually are being guilt of many killing seen bearing of blood on hands. That first uh, of the example of Lady Macbeth, that's uh, uh, both her and uh, his and her husband uh, uh, are uh, Kill took Duncan's and that's a uh, hand uh, with her uh, red blood, red with blood that's uh, represent to the metaphysically uh, guilty blood, uh, noble blood. Noble blood refer to the heritage elite with a unique social or political position, the, which is commonly tracked back to the feudal era. Paranoid blood. This uh, expression describes Macbeth who become paranoid, brutal, and mentally insane when more killing happen in the novel that uh, represent of the madness of the Macbeth's re revengeful blood. This expression means vengeful blood for bloodshed require bloodshed in return. Hyterical blood in indicate suffer to a Macbeth because health area and hallucinate of Banco's ghost with blood coated hair. That's conclusion. Blood and red are used to represent murder and guilt in Macbeth. And uh, Shakespeare employed his image to describe Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Uh, blood is one of the most prominent motif in the Macbeth. 
it is your all it is also consider conclude that red color and blood indicate to figurative language meaning that as a make based play have many social or political messages to send them to readers its references and thank you if you have any question you ask My question to you is, what does the blood on Lady Macbeth's hand represent? Yes, the blood on Lady Macbeth's hand represent her guilt and uh, Istem's guilt. Second. My question is, uh, how does Shakespeare use the color red to represent Macbeth's gift? Yes, Shakespeare used color red to represent Macbeth's gift by the, the her hunt him and uh, uh, scarred his souls. Thank you. Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rahul Desai, and my today I will present my presentation on the paper number uh, one zero one. <clears throat> my presentation topic is uh, adaptation of the rower from stage to screen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rahul Desai. Today I will present my presentation on the topic of uh, adapt adaptation of the rover from stage to screen. Uh, this is my self introduction. In this PPT, you will find these points. <coughs> these points. Now let's uh, start with the background of the rover. Background of the rover. Uh, rover is the play restoration comedy published in 1677 the rover writer was uh, afra benz uh, the rover plays setting in naples italy uh, time duration like uh, 1640s to 15s london duke's theater uh, in this play 
we can find uh, many major themes like love revenge gender class relationships and redemption uh, also histo historical context uh, uh, afra ben was the first uh, time woman actress play her own role afra ben almost lost into our english literature carnival culture reflects into the rover next point is why adapt the play to the screen because uh, re reason behind this uh, point uh, learning new concept learning new themes learning new uh, elements and introducing new language in modern time <coughs> adapt adaptation of the play uh, adaptation plays to film can preserve the original work and keep it alive for future generation <coughs> plays have a limited reach to the audience but while films films have a reach wider audience especially internationally working on new thoughts new idea new preservations and many other change made in the adaptation what are the changes in this so changes are like uh, location the play set in naples while the film was set in the post epochally Uh, epoch lipt elliptic australian outback uh, characters some minor characters are merged or some minor characters are uh, cut uh, from this uh, play dialogues so some somewhere changes in these uh, dialogues <coughs> the dialogues was updated to make it more accessible to contemp uh, contemporary audience while keeping its originally wit and humor themes are changes the film emphasizes the place theme of colonial colonialism and empowerment so there are the changes in the stage to screen adaptation what are the challenges challenges updating the language language updating in the modern sense uh, we can find a, a restoration language and modern language different different types of <clears throat> play features archaic language and reference that needed to be translated into modern context context translating the vision if you have dream you work on it that the uh, quote proved by this uh, director david micho david micho working on this uh, uh, restoration comedy or play or any other features of this uh, concept audience expectation <clears throat> ben's play is not very well known outside the theater circle which that means that film adaptation had a complete with other more established work and genre uh, there are the uh, notable adaptations from stage to screen first one is hamlet 1996 directed by kenneth panga then second les miserable uh, 2012 directed by tom hooper and third one is no country for old men 2007 directed by the coen brothers <coughs> this are the example of the adaptation of screen uh, stage to screen impact of the film adaptation on the play popularity when we uh, we uh, like to see movies and uh, screening uh, that's why popularity it more and more build the film's popularity introduce a new generation to the play and help it gain new fans adaptations the success of the film inspired a wave of new adaptation of classic play and australian cinema discussion discussion about the themes idea elements thoughts and many others this uh, this is the conclusion here uh, uh, this play the rover is explore the many major themes like uh, work on in the love relationship violence and <clears throat> many other new elements uh, now this is the citation and thank you if you have any questions you can ask me.
my question is what is the significance of the title of road in your opinion oh yes thank you in my opinion the significance of the title rover is uh, explore the world explore the uh, reality explore, explore the thoughts and collective collective nature uh, any thoughts idea or work on it thank you any other So my question is, what does a rover symbolize? Rover, the name is also symbolized the rover. Rover is uh, symbolized the new world, new country. And uh, also the idea of uh, convert, uh, conversation of the uh, dream into reality. Thank you. Stop sharing, Dadi. Just share. Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Chrome tab. This one. Share. Okay. Dadi. Not this one. I think. No. Yeah. I. What you say? Stop sharing. Good morning, everyone. I am Akash Chowda, and uh, my presentation topic is uh, Lady Macbeth, the enigmatic fourth witch of Shakespeare's Macbeth. So this is my personal information, and uh, these many things we have to look in this presentation. Uh, first one. The introduction of Lady Macbeth. Uh, Lady Macbeth is an important and a complex character in the Shakespeare's play Macbeth and uh, uh, one of the pivotal characters in the tragedy of Macbeth. The scheming spouse who plots villainy at the center of Shakespeare's devastating Scottish play and a figure of almost peerless malevolence. She was based on a woman described in Holinshed's Chronicle as a burning in unquenchable desire to bear the name of Queen. As we have known that uh, 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 this play, Macbeth, is also based on the Hollinshed's Chronicle as well. Lady Macbeth, with her, with her all ambition, 
supernatural association and the uncanny influence could be considered more than just a witch. The line between the evil human being and the scheming witch is so thin for Lady Macbeth that she could be either. Uh, Lady Macbeth's role is a kind of a puppet master and she pulls the string of uh, Macbeth uh, uh, quite mercilessly and uh, encourages him to pass the witch's prophecy. And in this effect, uh, she becomes another witch. Over the course of the play, Lady Macbeth manipulates her husband and spurs him to kill King Duncan. And for she believes that he deserves, he is the rightful king of throne of Scotland. First, we, we have to see the supernatural elements in the Lady Macbeth. This, this is the key link between the Lady Macbeth and the three witches. They both call upon the spirits for their assistance in the time of need. Uh, this is evident in the Act 1, Scene 5. Come, you spirits that tend on a mortal thought, unsex me here. And moving further, the dispose of feminine traits. Both the characters, Lady Macbeth and the three witches, exhibits and androgynous characters, uh, mean that they both have the masculine traits and uh, feminine traits together. Uh, and this is evident when Banco, Banco first encounters the uh, three witches and observes the genderless appearance of the witches and he was perplexed. That, and he says that you should be woman and yet your beards forbid me to interpret uh, that you are so. Uh, uh, beard is a uh, masculine stereotypical uh, uh, characteristics of a male but why it is uh, shown by the uh, witches as well. So one thing is here to be noted that Lady Macbeth has only masculine mental traits uh, while witches, three witches has a masculine physical appearance as well as the mental character. Uh, and further, Lady Macbeth taunts Macbeth for lack of masculine resolve and reignites his passion to pursue the power at any cost. Uh, basically, Ma uh, Macbeth was a uh, war hero and he killed countless people on the battlefield. But yet, he cannot kill the King Duncan. He initially hesitates. And he, he tells that when you just do it, then you are a man and to be more than what you are. And you would be so much more than a man. And she began a certain gender ambiguity with the witches. Uh, the Lady Macbeth is anti-mother. Uh, she uh, embodies the complete unnaturalness of the play and she convinced Macbeth to do the terrible deed of killing King Duncan. Uh, I have given suck. I would have plucked my nipples from his boneless gums and dashed the brain out. Uh, Macbeth, uh, Macbeth also remarks upon her utter lack of the maternal warmth as well. And uh, now we have to see the defense for Lady Macbeth as a guilt. Uh, unlike three witches, Lady Macbeth shows guilt a sign of vulnerability. Lady Macbeth's mind is infected with guilt uh, and she is full of madness. That She asserts that all the perfume of Arabia will not sweeten her hand. And previously, Lady Macbeth is caught at darkness and dimness, but at the end of the play, she seek, uh, she craves for clarity and to be free from dirty. Uh, Contim, she was uh, haunted by the sight of blood. This is the famous sleepwalking scene that uh, he, she tries to wash off the uh, imaginary blood from her hand and says that, out damn spot, out I say. Uh, and, but we do not see the, any retribution or punishment for the witches tampering in the human life at the end of the play. But uh, Lady Macbeth, we can see she is in the guilt and a complete madness. And the, in the conclusion, we can say the witches dominates the drama, but Lady, uh, lady dominates everything. She is the main reason behind the tragedy of Macbeth. And La uh, Lady Macbeth can be considered as a fourth witch because uh, she is not feeling guilty until the very end of the play. And uh, she is the main reason behind the tragedy of Lord Macbeth. Uh, these are the references. And thank you, if you have any question. I have a question. Uh, does Lady Macbeth's character also represent the characters of contemporary women? Yes, uh, if we see in the contemporary time, there are some women uh, that we can compare with the Lady Macbeth. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, in my opinion, uh, not that much uh, uh, what we can say the malevolence possessed by the woman in contemporary time. So it is, I guess, far fetched idea about the Lady Macbeth that no one can. Uh, kill his own son in order to convince someone and that that is
Lady Macbeth, the fourth witch in Macbeth. Do you agree? Yes, we can consider Lady Macbeth uh, as a fourth witch because she is the main reason behind the tragedy and the fall of Macbeth from the beginning at the end. Okay, thank you everyone. Hello everyone, good morning. I am Bhumi Bagohil and today I will present The Art of Satire, Dryden versus Swift. These are my academic information. So let us quickly see what is satire. Satire is a genre of visual and literary performing arts. So it is it uses humor to expose flaws and provides constructive criticism to society. There are major three types of satire, Horatian, Juvenalian, and Menippean. Horatian is the gentlest form of satire. In here, the humor is uh, humor takes the center stage, and uh, individual follies are usually uh, criticized. Juvenalian is the harshest type of satire, and in here, the biting criticisms are uh, given openly. And uh, Menippean satire. Menippean satire leans towards Juvenalian satire, but it criticizes a mental attitude. So let us see the satirist John Dryden. He was an English poet, literary critic, satirist, and playwright. He was England's first poet laureate. And he is also considered father of English criticism. And his contribution to English literature was so much that uh, the entire age is called the age of Dryden. Uh, here we can examine his most famous satire, Absalom and Achitophel. So it is a, a narrative poet, poem written in heroic couplet. And it's, it uses this um, allegory to narrate the biblical rebellion of Absalom against the King David. And uh, he uses allegory to represent his contemporary situation through this story. So uh, his king, King Charles II, is used, is signified as King David, and uh, his illegitimate son becomes Absalom. And that is how the poem goes. Now let us see the satire style of Dryden. So he is a master of classical form of satire. And in his satire, we see the influence of Horace and Juvenalian. This means that there is humor, but there is also thinly veiled insults. And he is also a masterful portrayal of controlled contempt. This means that uh, he insults somebody, but not in such a way that they feel offended. And uh, he makes use of dignified scorn and ironic praise to uh, achieve his purpose. And we can also see the elevated style of writing. So this means that he never uses vulgar or low language or indecent imagery. Now we will see Jonathan Swift. He was an Anglo-Irish author, political pamphleteer, satirist, and essayist. 
and he had a very struggleful life and uh, in very early age his father died and he had to grow up with his uncle and due to political situation at the time he was uh, moved from ireland to england and through his writing he challenged societal norms with thought provoking uh, writings and questions uh suppose a modest proposal so it, it is a proposal of cannibalism as a solution for poverty he says to the poor people that you should sell your children as food and in this way he criticizes the british policy towards ireland so we will quickly see his satire style and uh, mostly he does political and social commentary and it is not a source of amusement for him so there is not uh, entertainment is not the center stage it is moral and ethical critique and he makes use of sarcasm hyperbole mockery all of that and of course his signature sharp wit and clever wordplay and there is an advocacy for change so swift does not just point out the flaws he wants them to change uh, here is a comparison of dryden and swift one of the major thing we can see is dryden was writing for the government he was employed by the king and swift was writing writing against the government he would just point out the flaws in the society uh dryden is criticizing while entertaining because he had to entertain his court so that is why he his work is also entertaining but swift just throws serious scathing criticisms at his opponents and dryden addresses political issues and swift also addresses the societal and uh, the current time issues and uh, his opinion is not biased you can say and dryden has a sympathy for his targets for his opponents he does not go as we established earlier but swift has a sympathy for common people so these are the differences now in conclusion uh, we saw that they are distinct yet significant contribution of dryden and swift to the art of satire they lived in different time periods and wrote in contrasting styles yet they left an incredible mark on english literature and uh, these are my references and thank you now for any questions Rumi whose satire do you think is more superior uh i think that is a subjective matter and that depends on what do you personally like but i think swift satire is more superior uh, when compared to current times because in today's world we need people who would stand up for what is wrong and stand their ground and demand change any other question rumi <clears throat> is there any difference between classical satire and uh, satire of dryden age uh yes there is quite a difference uh classical satire is uh, as i said uh, there are three types of satire so it was limited to that uh, dryden satire is a mixture of uh, horatian satire and juvenalian satire so it is you can say quite evolved from the classical satire
हेलो एवरीवन आई धात्री परमार एंड टुडे इज माई टॉपिक ऑफ प्रेजेंटेशन इज मेटाफिजिकल मिथ्स मशीन अ कंपेरेटिव एक्सप्लोरेशन ऑफ पोएट्री मेटाफिजिकल पोएट्री इज बेसिकली रिटर्न इन सेवनटीन सेंचुरी बाय अ वाइज इंडिविजुअल्स एंड इन विच दे आर राइटिंग अबाउट रिलीजियस थीम एंड philosophical themes throughout this and if we compare it it in a present time then today computer based programs such as chat gpt and ai based other program are writing this kind of a poetry so in which uh, this presentation we are going to see the comparison of both of that uh, first of all let us take a look at what is a metaphysical poetry so it emerged in 17th century and uh, it explored the philosophical themes and uh, main element of the metaphysical poetry is conceit so there is using of a far fetched image in images which are not uh, similar to each other uh, some of the notable uh, a notable figure of the metaphysical poets are john donne and drew marvel henry vaughan george herbert and richard crashaw and their main aim was to uh, use a conceit and give a moral message through it uh, samuel johnson in 18th century coined this term known as a metaphysical poetry in his work and uh, uh, he he stated this term as a der derogatory term which later become a famous but now it is considered as a, a positive term um, this is the a poem which is generated by chat gpt so basically i gave prompt to chat gpt and he uh, it wrote the uh, this poetry uh, let us take a look that what kind of uh, similarities and dissimilarities it has so Uh, i took the poem of the flea by john donne and uh, i just gave same prompt to the chat gpt to write poem on the flea so both of the uh, in the first we take a look at the john donne's poem then it is a classical metaphysical poetry on the other hand a chat gpt based generated poem is similar because it is written by our prompt and uh, both has a rich imaginary and vivid symbols in it that they used uh, main uh, difference is that that in uh, for example in uh, the flea poem by john donne a uh, poet states that uh, speaker is uh, biting one flea to speaker and then the flea is biting to his beloved now they have a physical advancement so now they don't have to worry about that or fear about that on the other hand uh, it's a chat gpt generated poem showed that uh, flea is biting the speaker and then beloved so now their uh, love is in the body of flea so it is uh, symbolizing the pure love not apart from that not going beyond that um main criteria that we take a look so the uh, criteria of the authorship so so the john donne written the flea poem is written by a human poet on the other hand uh, the chat gpt's poem is generated by ai program uh, uh, then uh, the time period that the uh, John Donne's flea is written in 17th century. On the other hand, whenever I gave prompt to Chat GPT, it written so it it is basically written in modern time. Uh, complication that uh, John Donne's the flea poem is more complicated in uh, using of imaginary and symbols and conveying its idea. On the other hand, uh, Chat GPT's poem is least complex, so you can easily grasp the meaning of the poetry by reading it. Uh, uh, on the other hand, John Donne's poem has a personal voice and of course the chat gpt generated poem has not the personal voice because we gave command to it and it written so uh, the john donne's flea poem is authentic and on the other hand uh, chat gpt has combined all the knowledge which was given to it and then it create a poetry so it is based on learning um ai poetry in future so ai is a uh, writing is not data it means of expression and non scientific computer program has nothing to express uh, for example if we are giving prompt to chat gpt then it generates poem first it needs data after that it can create on the other hand humans has their uh, own human have their own imagination their own creativity so they can create their poetry and chat gpt can make a, a poetry by the data which it has so there is a major difference and it cannot uh, take a place of human so in the present time we can find the question that does chat gpt take place of human or creative writing or not so the clear answer is no that it cannot take uh, the place is of human creative human's creative writing on the other hand creative collaboration so how chat gpt can help create in creative writing such as writing fictional and poetry so it 
use a uh, transform writing with suggestions grammar editing we can do and then creative ideas simplifying the ideas and enhancing the writing process that it give us a new kind of ideas when we are giving it a prompt so in a way chat gpt provides us a background to start writing a creative writing so uh, chat gpt help or even other any ai based platform can help us but the main problem is the ethical implication that we cannot uh, uh, take it as an ethical uh, ethical genre but but as uh, we now getting the idea that journals are started publishing the poetry and fictional writing which is generated by chat gpt and other based platform so it is emerging field but uh, right now the ethical issue is there and language evolution is also there because the john dunn's poem the, uh, the flea is written in uh, 17th century so the its language is more complex bit complex on the other hand the modern poetry which is generated by chat gpt has a common language so it is it can easily uh, understand by other people so this is the uh, main uh, criteria which we take a look in conclusion when we compare john dunn's poem the flea to chat gpt's poem that how old and new poetry are different and john dunn's poem is complex and shows human emotion on the other hand chat gpt's poem is generated by computer so it has not a kind of a feeling or emotions and in future ai generated poetry like chat gpt's can help human poets by giving them ideas or improving their work it might even help create new poetry style however human emotions and creativity is still be special in poetry and ai cannot replace it so creative writing is in the hand of human mind so chat gpt cannot generate so this is the concluding so okay uh, these are the references and uh, thank you if you have any question feel free to ask So that the less far-fetched images are covered in the poetry generated by the chat GPT. Uh, yes, chat GPT generated poem also use the symbol of a flea in it. So the symbol is used, but not that kind of a far-fetched image we can find because it has already all the data in it. So it can create a poetry within that data. It cannot go beyond that data. So far-fetched images are there, but not uh, chat GPT cannot provide a new far-fetched images. There are far-fetched images of the flea. we saw how developed the ai uh, developed the ai programs are they can create significant art from inspired art right so do you think they are a challenge to contemporary artists uh it cannot be challenged to contemporary artists yes in some way it can challenge that uh, now creative writer have to think beyond that but it can uh, help create it can helps in creative writing because uh, whenever you are giving some prompt to chat gpt or any other ai based platform it will give you a new, new 10 creative ideas so the creative writing can be more productive in this way by using this kind of a platform so it cannot be harm the contemporary artist but it can be useful for contemporary artist okay thank you
Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Myself Hardi Vora, and my uh, to, today's my subject is Afra Benz the Rover: A sub Subversive Challenge to Social Norms. Yes. So hello everyone. Good afternoon. My today's my subject is Afra bans the rover up sub subversive challenge to social norms. Here is my personal information, points to ponder. So let's discuss firstly, uh, introduction of Afra Ben. Uh, Afra Ben born on 1614, Harbeldown, Kent, England, died on ap April 16th, 1689, London. Her occupation is English dramatics, fiction writer and poet. She, she, she was the first English woman known to earn her living by her writing. Notable works, Orunoko and the Rover. So let's uh, discuss the introduction of the Rover. The Rover or uh, the Rover or the Banished Cavalier, which is the subtitle of the Rover, is the most popular play by the Restoration playwright Afra Ben and uh, first performed in 1677. Although Ben's work as a spy for Charles II came to a sudden and end with a spell De debtor's prison she was a stute royalist and the title refers charles supporters who were living in exile on the con continent in the tradition of re uh, re restoration comedy the play follows the wild exploits and a group uh, group of english gentlemen in the naples at carnival time although many of the tropes of the genre and uh, subverted at the it uh, subverted to an extent which sent sh uh, shock waves through the theater world. Ben's inf in infamous Lib Libertine Wil Wilmore was an instant hit, and the rover kept rover uh, the rover kept kept her to the overnight fame and brought her an income income for the box office, making her one of the first women to earn a living by by their pen all women together ought to lay, let flowers fall upon the tomb of afraben which is most scand scandalously but rather appropriately in west westminster abbey for it was she who earned them the right speaks their minds virginia wolf a uh, room of ones uh, so let so now Subversion of the gender role, which is the main theme, we can say that uh, of the rover. Uh, in this, in this uh, subversion of ro gender roles, uh, the female characters like Helena and Florinda are com commodified, or the commodified and ob objectified by the hand of masculine cap capitalistic ideology. Women have been treated. As, as mere object to be consumed in the market in order of fulfill physical and spiritual satisfaction in the rover. Likewise, the agents of male-oriented capitalistic society, Captain Wilmore and Don Antonio, who may gain incredible power and authority through market economy, uh, must re reconcile their governing power and their humanity. Uh, second one is a morality and class hierarchy. Uh, in the in the rover, uh, we can explore the themes of morality and the uh, class hierarchy with the context of 17th century society. Said during the carnival in Naples, uh, the play revolves around the adventure of a ground group of Englishmen and women, highlighting the conflict of complexities. The arise the societal norms clash uh, with personal desires one of the central aspect of morality depicted uh, in the play of the ten, uh, 
play is the tension between societal expectation and individual freedom uh, uh, which uh, uh, in uh, this we, we can uh, see in the wilmore and uh, of uh, helena's uh, relationship ben challenges the conventional morality of her time presenting characters who challenges uh, traditional gender roles and pursue their desires for instance the character and character of helena and young woman of noble family rebels against the her brother's plan to force her into lo loveless marriage instead she disguises herself as a gypsy and ve ventures into the carnival to experience freedom and love on her terms this subversion of gender roles and def defines a uh, source of societal norms demonstrate bans a uh, critic of res uh, restrictive morality imposed on women so in concluding we can say that uh, afra bens the rover is a compelling play that de de delve uh, into themes of love societal constraints offering a vivid explore exploration of human nature and complex complexities of relationship through its complex uh, character and witty dialogues uh, ben offer the thought provoking commentary on her time making the rover a timeless and enduring work of literature so here is my here are my uh, references and thank you if anyone wants to ask any question so hardi what are your views on how women character are treated in the rover women uh, according to me women character are treated in rover like a uh, uh, so a, uh, orthodoxical mentality we uh, we we, uh, we may see in the in the uh, rover that uh, patriarchy is highly uh, highly represent in the play by afraben Hardy, my question is for you: Is who was Afraben's infamous libertine character in the Rover? Uh, Afraben's infamous libertine character in the Rover is the William. Wilmore, sorry. Thank you. stop sharing her kuch bhi karwa jo hmm acha present share your screen share this tape mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
So good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Hiral Vaitha, and today I'm dealing with the force marriage in the rover, analyzing arguments and defenses. So here is a, my uh, here is some uh, personal information of mine. Uh, here are some uh, points to ponder, which I'm dealing to in this uh, session. Info here are some uh, information about Afra Ben. Uh, she's uh, she's born in uh, 1640 England, died in uh, April 16 London. And uh, her work about and, and her genre about dramatist, uh, she's a fiction writer, poet. And her first, uh, first uh, the forced marriage, which I'm dealing to words. So the uh, arguments are that the Spanish sister, uh, sister Florinda and Helena and their cousin Valeria are dominated by their uh, brother Pedro. Pedro is con uh, confident that he can force Florinda to marry his powerful friend Antonio and save the cost of a dowry and Helena by sending her back to nunnery. So my defense is that that uh, in this uh, play we can uh, see that how a male dominating uh, personality of their brother uh, Don Pedro that uh, he he tries to control their uh, sisters to don't marry their uh, own choice uh, person but uh, he wants to uh, marry that Anton don antonio because to save uh, the dowry ghost so the second defense was that uh, through the disguise in which the spanish sisters and their cousin venture operates florinda can arrange elopement with her beloved bellona be, uh, below sorry belleville and helena and valeria can find their love matches so in the play we can see that how uh, florinda uh, loves belleville in uh, in the play but her, her uh, brother don uh, pedro tries to control her and uh, tell uh, tell her that you should uh, marry don uh, antonio so uh, he tries to control her and uh, after then he ran away from the castle uh, with the help of uh, her cousin valeria and uh, after at the end uh, afterwards that at the end of the play we can uh, see that uh, how florinda marry with belleville Helen, helena uh, marry with wilmore and valeria marry with frederick so after all that uh, all of the uh, all of the persons that find their uh, love of their life uh, so arguments are there. The Spanish sister Florinda and Helena and their cousin Valeria, dominated by their brother Pedro. So my defense is like how uh, empowerment is necessary, how awareness is necessary that we we have that right to find our uh, find our partner and we have to spend we have to spend their, uh, our life in uh, with that person. So we have that awareness and we have that uh, empowerment. So we can use in the right way. So uh, we need to uh, equal equal upon opportunity to. We can give the equal opportunity to all the uh, gender because of uh, that. Today's uh, today's time, we we don't uh, find that uh, uh, like patriarchal uh, thoughts. We we don't find that too much patriarchal thoughts but uh, in some of the caste and some of the like uh, caste and like uh, culture that we find that much uh, thoughts so the stereotype deconstruction we need to stereotypes uh, deconstruction with, with the empowerment and the education so argument it has been argued that forced marriage violates number of interna international human rights instruments and standards from a human rights perspective. So according to this article, uh, Gil and Anitha said that, and, and particularly mentioned that um, choose the partner, choose the right partner and have the life with him or her. So it's the uh, right, like uh, it's the U international human rights, okay? So, uh, so my defense is that like that in uh, today's, uh, 21st century we 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 are very much uh, empowered but uh, some of the culture and some of the patriarchal thoughts and some of the patriarchal uh, men's or uh, men's then families are not allowing allowing their uh, children to marry another like their choice by their choice 
so uh, at the end uh, married couples are there like florinda with belleville helena with the uh, with the wilmore and uh, valeria with the frederick so at the end we can find that uh, they marry with their love of the life and the, here is the uh, conclusion that at the uh, at the end of the play we find that uh, how the free will is more needed in the life so the uh, this play is a struggle for the cousins the helena valeria and the uh, uh, florinda and how the women controlled by their uh, by their own family members on uh, on their male family members so here is the, my presentation so if you have any question you can free feel to ask here are so sorry so uh, here are some resources so you can ask me Yes, Hiran. My question is for you: Is uh, according to you, is the freedom to marry and choose one's life partner considered a fundamental human right? Yes, it's because uh, it is because uh, when we uh, we because it's a uh, article and it's a it's a, it's mentioned in the uh, international article that we have that right to choose our partner. So uh, according to me, it's a uh, it's a part of like freedom and fundamental human right. Here, my question is for you is according to you, should women be allowed to choose their partner in present time rather than in bank time, bank time? So what is the difference between that? So yes, according to me that uh, we have uh, we need to em empowerment according that uh, that time because in uh, in it's a twenty first century and uh, at that time they they don't have that much uh, empowerment but at this time we have that uh, that much education we have, we have that much uh, uh, fundamental rights of our to choosing our uh, life partners okay so uh, according to me it's a uh, it's it's the right for us and it's the part of like that we 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 are free feel free to choose our partners thank you everyone Okay, so that was the last presentation of the day. Let us have a quick a feedback hey, on the thing. So tomorrow you can uh, have some improvement uh, on some suggestions which we can have from today. Okay, okay so uh, we started with... Uh, Akshay's uh, presentation on Rover. Uh, that was uh, a good topic was selected, theatrical uh, interpretations. Uh, but it was not completely justified. There was some reference to even this Me Too uh, reference which happened few years back and how that is interpreted. Some more example, exact examples about how uh, these differences are coming. That should be uh, discussed uh, in all these things. Uh, Chaya pre also presented on Women in Rover. Uh, you are citing uh, this uh, Rama Brothers, uh, that is study material website, books, uh, not website, but book, but that should be avoided. So avoid citing from study material websites uh, or from the same kind of books also. So that we should identify that these are study material which cannot be cited when you are doing research based writing uh, for presentation or assignments. Mm -hmm. Uh, Darshan also had a good topic on Heather and also well answered. Some of you are not answering questions properly. Eh? So that way you have to see that you explain your answer and take uh, three to four minutes eh, to answer. Don't just say yes or no and uh, within one line some of you are concluding your answer. But also tell why you say this or that. So he answered well. Uh, Akshay's question also was good on this. Uh, 
when some of you are asking the questions, you are still making some errors in drafting the question. Like uh, when Akshay was asked by Kavita, there was this tag, you agree, question mark. So that is not proper structure of question. So what we learn is that how to ask a question, which is grammatically correct sentence. When you write here, why we do that? So that you become aware that you have to ask grammatically correct question. And then you have to read it. Uh, you can take help of AI tools to put your question. Uh, you have your own mobile devices with you. Uh, whatever question you want to ask, you can ask AI tool to reframe it properly so that there is no error. And by doing that, you are learning that what error you are making and what is the correct form. So you are doing self-learning. Every time if you say that this is the error, you have to do this, then it doesn't look good. <laughs> Teachers uh, uh, pinpointing the mistake and telling. Sometimes uh, psychologically, we don't like that. Somebody telling us. That's why self-learning is important. And machine will not pinpoint. You ask and machine will tell you. That this is the mistake and that way you can improve. So you can start working on uh, uh, that. Many of the senior students were doing that uh, in the previous one. And so their questions were coming without mistake this time. Uh, that So that way if you might have observed, then you might have learned. Uh, that is how we learn a lot many things from observations. But we don't observe that is a problem. <laughs> we don't see how things are going on. And so we uh, uh, have to repeat that mistake. So that uh, you can see that how you can use some tools to see that the questions are properly framed. If you are able to do it without tool, it is good. But then there should not be no error or mistake in asking the question. Uh, Jagruti presented on metaphysical. You should give more examples. When you talk about poem or even play also, we had a good uh, quotes from in uh, Akash's presentation from play also. So that way, uh, cite something from original text or from the poems. When it is on poems, it should be cited you know, from the, the lines. Mm, Kavita uh, presented, uh, well, uh, uh, that was on this topic. Blood, that was a good topic that you have selected. Slides were also well prepared. Uh, answers you need to give a little bit longer. Huh? Some uh, Take your time. Five minutes for presentation. Four to five minutes to give answers. So that way you have 10 minutes for both the things. So take your time in giving uh, the answers. Uh, Rahul presented on adaptations of the rover from stage to screen. Topic was good, but still uh, was not able to get that content which you look for when you see the thing. You gave examples of examples from Hamlet, uh, No Country for Old Men, those all things. But where are the adaptations of the rover? Where are those things which and how many times they are done? That either pictures or things were not visible. So you, you are supposed to talk on how the this play rover has been turned into a film uh, on, on screen rather than another text uh, being converted. Uh, Akash presented very well on Macbeth and he also integrated all the sources also very well. Uh, some of you tried to do that. Uh, Akash uh, I did that. Uh, in the last one also, there was attempt. Hiral also tried. Datri also uh, tried. A uh, few of you uh, tried to integrate uh, the source. Uh, he also did it quite well. Mm -hmm. Apt images were also presented. Uh, the thing that you need to improve uh, on this is that when you put the citation of so-and-so critic, you have to also say that so-and-so critic in this article or in this book made this argument or said this, uh, so-and-so critic is of this opinion and then you are putting the opinion in double inverted commas on your on the slide. And then you tell what you want to say. You may agree with that. You disagree with that. So that all you add. So you want to say something and you are using critical observations to support or refute the argument. That is the basic idea. When you see in the rubric that it is well integrated. Well integrated means this. That you are using those sources to either support your argument or you refute. So it, basically you have something to say. And you are using those people to either support or refute. Uh, so you are not only talking what the other people have said. It's not that purpose only that here it is. The, here is the thing. There is the thing. Let me bring everything together. I will cite it properly. Present. What you have to say still will remain eh, to be said.
uh, Bhumiba also presented well. Satire, uh, good comparison was given between Dryden and Swift. Yeah. Few more examples might be given that how those differences are exemplified in their works. Uh, you answered also very well. So when you say an answer and then you give like because so and so, why you say this? You justify your answer eh, also. Uh, Datri also presented well by bringing this uh, poem, Jet GPT and other things. Uh, you, your conclusion was a little bit problematic. You concluded with this uh, uh, observation, uh, which needs to be uh, seen in a larger context. So your conclusion, uh, concluding side, uh, means conclusion means that is what you are saying ultimately after doing the debate uh, of this and that, uh, what so and so person said, you cited some good resources also. Uh, after that, you came to uh, this conclusion. You cited uh, two resources that were good to see in this. This was one. from Guardian, okay. the rise of robot authors is the writing on the wall for human novelists. Okay. So this now, again, when we see this was written in 2019, okay. this was, so it means that uh, that was a very advanced version of uh, chat GPT, 19, 19 is way back now. It seems like it was last birth, okay. not this one, because after last November, Chat GPT announced this advanced version. Things change. So all this uh, write-ups which was before uh, last November becomes very obsolete. Uh, it becomes quite all those uh, things uh, doesn't seem to be true also. Uh, this was a good uh, write-up which was a very recent one. July 23. And this write-up doesn't conclude the way you are concluding this writer, uh, what you are concluding is like this one, which was written previously, 2019 version. Uh, that was your tone of concluding uh, the, the things there. But this uh, tells something else. You brought one point from this and that was about ethical concern. Mm -hmm. Ethical concern yeah, is what you brought from this impact on the literary landscape. So this this is a very interesting writer where it says democratizing the writing process, opportunities and challenges for writers. But I was not able to see what you concluded yeah, in this. In terms of the conclusion was in terms of uh, this idea that uh, human feelings, emotions and feelings which humans are capable of doing, machines cannot do. So they lake deep emotions and this idea. So that was uh, the, the conclusion uh, that you have done. Uh, I would suggest you, you and others also uh, to watch this TED talk also. Because this debate uh, has been overcome quite earlier. Uh, this debate about humans capacity of emotions and Machines cannot. So can a computer write a poetry? Uh, uh, this is on my blog also from where you can search and reach there. What if machines write poems? And this was in 2017. Way ahead of chat GPT idea. <laughs> Much ahead of that when algorithms were emerging and people were talking about. So there are uh, this idea and uh, uh, it gives. Now what, what is important here is that they took a, a, a test. They gave uh, poems to people. So you prepare a poem from a machine and original human poem. And then you ask people, can you identify whether this poem is written by a human or a computer? So when this was done, we, we uh, keep on getting very curious replies that, uh, for example, see this uh, response. Though the poem, this poem was written by human, but still lot many people, 50, almost 52% of the people said it is computer poem. It means what we think of human emotions and feeling. Uh, uh, sometimes computer poems are writing more emotional poem than humans. And humans are writing the poem which doesn't seem to be human at all. 
that is the thing so that that argument is gets falsified otherwise our conclusions are biased conclusions it becomes biased so i have not tested whether what i conclude is true these people have already tested and this was being tested in 2017 before that also people are testing and they say that no you can't conclude that humans write emotional things and machines do not write humans also write something that is not emotional also or very mechanical also so that that argument uh, is what they try to uh, debate upon uh, so lots of this is 2016 article uh, can you tell who wrote this poems <laughs> so it means it is confusing to tell whether we can uh, think of that in, in in that simple manner or not uh, so that th this all needs to be reviewed this is what we call we have to review before we come to uh, the conclusion uh, 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 of anything uh, now if you see this uh, poem that you have generated uh, uh, which you have given as a link also uh, in this in the citation you have put this link uh, about uh, this poem that is generated so write your prompt was write metaphysical poetry on uh, 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 death now if i if you read a poem it seems like it is very much like a human being it doesn't seem that it is lacking human emotion so if you independently give this poem to somebody and tell that I have written this poem, the person will not doubt that, no, you have not written. It is, they will not think that this is generated by chat GPT. So it reads, the in twilight's shroud where shadows softly weep, shadows weeping. It is very much like a, a personification that humans would do. The breath of life in silent slumber lies. In death, we grasp uh, the secrets buried deep as mortal flesh to spirit gently flies. Mortal body is converting into spirit and is gently flying away. The tapestry of being finely spun unravels at the touch of death's embrace. Uh, so it, it sounds very interesting. A journey of the realm where none have gone Beyond the veil, we seek a higher space. In cosmic dance, the cosmic dance, that is this dance of Nataraj, the cosmic uh, dance, the dance of atom. The, in cosmic dance where stars and souls entwine. It is quite interestingly emotional. The stars and the uh, uh, souls entwine. The death of self reveals a greater whole. From finite form, we touch the infinite line. Anant, that is what we call Anant, we reach, that is infinite line. Uh, and find in death the essence of the soul. So fear not, friend. So fear not. Don't fear death. So fear not, friend, the darkness and the night. Don't be afraid of darkness and the night. For death, the portal leads to endless light you will open up into a new realm of light so uh, emotionally also it is quite significant poem so to conclude that this poem doesn't have emotion is a is that bias because i know this is machine so i am telling machine cannot have emotion that is that is my bias that is functioning in judging uh, the things uh, uh, also so that was uh, that you need to see eh, that uh, some uh, re more review before we conclude uh, anything uh, Hardi also presented well on uh, Rover. You also need to give detailed answers. And Hirals also was uh, presented very well uh, on this. Okay. okay, fine. So uh, we end our uh, this session with uh, this presentation here. Okay.